Hello everybody, welcome back to another exciting edition of the Shining Developer Series. My name is Eric Nance and I am so delighted that you joined us from wherever you are around the world. And as per usual on these series of interviews that we do on the show, I always like to highlight some innovative and impactful use cases of Shiny in the real world that are demonstrating some really solid technical backend infrastructure so that we all can learn from these great examples and apply them to our projects and see the potential that Shiny has to offer. And I am thrilled that today, so I'm welcoming back, actually I'm welcoming for the first time on this show, a voice that you've heard in some of my other adventures, but it is my pleasure to introduce to you, Mike Thomas. Hello, Mike, how are you doing today? Doing great, Eric. Thank you so much for having me on the Shiny Dev series. It's been a series that I have learned so much from over the years of you doing this and, and very excited to actually be speaking with you on the series myself today. Today, So thank you for having me on. Oh, yeah, we've been uh, we've been connected for a while now, thanks to our efforts of the R Weekly Highlights. And I think you're, you're a perfect fit for what we're about to talk about today. But for those that haven't been following you in previous uh, efforts that we've done, maybe you could give our listeners a bit of background and kind of your journey to R and then the Shiny thereafter. Sure. Uh, I am currently the chief data scientist at Catchbrook Analytics, uh, but my journey to R is sort of a unique one, I think so. Um, so in my junior year of college, my, my stats class, I got introduced to R. So I was actually an accounting major, but I was taking a math minor because I really you know, loved mathematics. Didn't think I had the chops to be a full math major, but I wanted to keep it in my back pocket maybe for the future. Um, I didn't even know that some term data science existed. But in this class, my junior year, Robin Stats, uh, we got introduced to R. And we were doing things on the whiteboard, uh, theoretically. And then our professor would have us just edit an R Markdown document that he had already kind of put together and knit that and submit that as our homework assignment. And a lot of my other math classes, I will admit, I was not as strong in. But then I realized in this class that if I could code it, I could understand the theory that we were doing. And so much clicked for me at that point in time. And, you know, did that senior year as well, you know, went on uh, and got that math minor. But after I graduated, I did go into public accounting and, and I stopped programming um, for about a year and, and started my, my career in public accounting and consulting. Realized there was this, this big empty hole that, that was missing career-wise for me. And that was really the math stuff that I had sort of left behind when I went into accounting. So I decided to go back uh, for my master's degree. I had heard about this, this new thing called data science. And in this master's program, I got reintroduced to programming in R. And the curriculum in that program was so applied that I was actually able to leverage what I was learning in the classroom at night after work in the office at my job the next day. And I think, as they say, you catch the bug and <laughs> it's hard to stop. Yes. So. That's my journey to R. I haven't really stopped since. And my journey to Shiny, uh, you know, kind of came somewhat later in that process. But I saw what others in the community were doing with Shiny dashboards, and I immediately saw the potential. And it comes from, I think, a place that maybe a lot of people can empathize with when you're getting started out in data analysis. And you're living in spreadsheets, and spreadsheets are your front end. Um, and you kind of miss that final piece that's really critical to business on how to make something tangible for others. Uh, so many projects at work called for some sort of a user interface, and Excel just didn't have the chops to be that user interface for a lot of these projects. I saw Shiny emerging. I started doing some personal projects, but I didn't know how to stand those things up uh, any way other than shinyhaps.io, which is a you know phenomenal service that our studio has put together. Yes. But when you are in a corporate environment, uh, it, it's maybe not the, the best place to be able to stand up your apps you know, behind a firewall and security and, and all those types of things. Phenomenal for personal projects. And it, it, it really gave me my start into Shiny. 
So I will give a shout out. I, I later enrolled in Matt Dancho's Advanced Shiny and AWS course and really learned a lot about building production grade Shiny apps and that final step in the process about you know, getting those things into somewhere secure in production, you know, working with the Unix command line, spinning up a cloud server and, and actually getting that app into prod. So that was an incredibly useful, uh, you know, we talk about all the different resources that there are, you know, out there where you don't necessarily have to get a PhD nowadays to do incredible things, uh, you know, in your business or in your organization. And that was one for me that, that, that paid off uh, dividends. So, you know, I, I guess maybe I'll just wrap here quickly and say that, that Shiny has been really a life-changing technology for me. You know, we'll talk a lot about this today. And I personally think that it's, it's one of the most transformative technologies that we have in business today. I think it's only continuing to explode. So uh, you know, spare me your, your Bitcoin and your NFTs. I really think that the hottest topic in tech and business is Shiny, and that's what it should be. Well, that's that's going to be quick later on. I love it. I love it, Mike. Uh, <laughs> and I, I resonate so much with that. And as one of the uh, quote unquote gray beards in, in the shiny space, um, even early on when a lot of us were still kind of fumbling our way through what we could do with it, I still saw the potential. And it was amazing when simple prototypes on a simple server that I spun up internally at the day job that I administered for Shiny Server, uh, what became Shiny Server Profession, well, it was actually the open source version in, in those days. Um, and little did I know how quickly it was going to take off. And thank goodness that I was able to get help from our, our um, talented friends on the Linux uh, IT group to help me with that. But it, it certainly, I can echo what you said. It's been transformative to the things I do. Where I met in life sciences, it's been a critical component in many aspects of our development process now and it's only getting bigger from there so certainly very much resonate with how that's been transforming with with my workflow as well and um, you did mention at the top you are uh, the chief scientist at catchbook analytics um, why don't you give us a little uh, story about how 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 that how catchbook came to be sure so so catchbook is a data science consulting firm uh, really focused on designing end-to-end -end data science solutions for our customers, you know, going through all portions of the project lifecycle from data management to analysis to developing whatever that solution is going to be, whether that be a shiny app, uh, a model wrapped up as a web API, and then all the way through to, to production and actually putting that somewhere where, where the organization can use it. So I think that probably lends itself to Catchbrook's origin story because I had seen a lot of consultants handing over a project deliverable that solved part of that life cycle, um, but not the entire customer's problem. You know, I saw great statistical models that were handed over as, you know, Microsoft Word documents with, with really complicated methods and detailed mathematical equations. But you go back to the customer and, and they never did anything with it because they didn't know how to integrate that into their systems and processes. And then I also saw, you know, consultants developing web applications where they kind of just went away for six months and came back at the end of the project, um, you know, maybe with a really nice looking web app, but they didn't consult the domain experts along the way. Um, you know, those applications look great and probably check the boxes on the contract that they signed, but they don't actually help the employees who are going to be using it on a day to day basis uh, because they didn't take the time to understand their workflow and learn about the actual people uh, or the person who's going to be impacted uh, by that web app. So I became really passionate about what I call end-to-end -end data science and, and believing that if one component of the end-to-end -end life cycle of a data science project is missing, then the project itself is likely to fail, uh, in my opinion. And I think it'll become, you know, one of those Forbes statistics about how 80% of analytics projects fail. Um, so I found that in almost all of those cases, the component of the project that fails really is that final hurdle of actually getting the solution stood up. Um, you know, whether that be wrapping a model up as an API endpoint, hosting a web app somewhere users can access it, you know, scheduling it, uh, that analysis as a, as a cron job report just that actual final step of, of turning the analysis or research into something tangible, a product. 
Um, and, and I think the way that a lot of consultants I was seeing had solved this problem in the past, you know, maybe by delivering a statistical model and then upselling, you know, hey, if you want a place to, to run this model with your data and manage the results, you know, we have this, this separate X dollar platform that you can purchase a license to, you know, for a, a lot of money per year. Um, and, and as you know, that still happens to this day in a lot of organizations. Sure does. Yep. But for those of us who, who use R and Python on a day to day basis, we know that we have this incredible cutting edge, you know, open source ecosystem of tools at our fingertips to build and deploy these types of pro projects. And Catchbrook's origination story, you know, really revolves around my own strong desire to demonstrate the value of the open source tools that we have and, and show you how we can rig rigorously build custom tools for your organization that provide, you know, a ton more value than having to go the other way and fit your company's processes and procedures into some off the shelf platform. You know, I, I think 10 or 15 years ago, there was probably a fair debate on, on the value of you know buying these off the shelf tools and fitting your business into those um, because you know maybe it solved for eighty percent of your analytics problem versus spending the money on having a, a solution custom built. But nowadays, you know, with what we have for open source packages that we have at our disposal, it's really that speed to solution. It's orders of magnitude faster than it used to be. Um, so we can really build these things custom tailored to the way that your, your business runs in, in quite a, a quicker timeline um, than we were used to be able to do. So I think this might be a, a good time to, to share one of my favorite stories that, that really aligns with our mission here at Catchbrook. And it'll probably lead us in, into our next question. Uh, but it's the, it's the story of Olivia Adams, who is a web developer at Athena Health, uh, pretty close by to me in Massachusetts. Uh, so I don't know if you know this story, Eric, but in early February of 2021, which was right after vaccines had just started getting rolled out to, to the older population groups here in the US, mm -hmm. she was trying to help her parents use the government website. And I, I think it was called VAMS, V-A-M-S, to sign up for their vaccine appointment. And not only were her in-laws struggling with it, but when she tried to help them, she realized it was a very convoluted and difficult process for her to even Ooh. help with. And she's a web developer. Well, <laughs> uh, I can't say I'm too surprised hearing about this, but I won't, I won't, <laughs> I won't go on that tangent. But yes, uh, that's not surprising to me. So if, if I remember right, I, I think on that website, you know, you might see an appointment available. And then when you click to sign up, it, it would disappear and say it was no longer available. Yes, I or heard you that had to, times, yep. Or you had to like randomly type in zip codes around you to try to find an appointment in that town um, because it didn't have any sort of you know proximity calculations um, and, and you know if it's a web experience that you and I find difficult then most likely it's going to be even more difficult for the senior population who were the ones eligible at that time. Yep, exactly. And it, it led to a lot of stories of pharmacies and vaccination sites throwing away supply at the end of the day. Yeah. because people were having such a difficult time getting signed up for appointments. So back to Olivia, she was on maternity leave at the time, home with a two-year-old and her newborn. And she spent about 40 hours in total developing a website that went out and scraped appointments and availability from as many different places as she could find. CVS, you know, grocery stores, healthcare-sponsored websites that were giving vaccinations at schools and even Fenway Park in Massachusetts. And she centralized it all in this one place, this one singular website, where you could go and see the up-to-the-minute information on where vaccines were available with a big, nice button hyperlink to the page to get signed up. And people loved it. Um, and it led to her appearing on CNN and just about every news station here in New England and I think that the big elephant in the room for everyone was the fact that she had created something in 40 hours while on maternity leave that was a better product than you know what the U.S. government had paid you know, $44 million to a very well-known big box consulting firm to create. And, and I, I share that story because it's exactly the same storyline that I've seen played out so many times at companies that I've observed 
and worked for obviously just on a much bigger national scale. Right. But it, it really demonstrates the power of open software uh, and the speed to solution that we have at our fingertips now and how these code first approaches allow us to, to really provide custom tailored solutions that meet these problems head on, whether they be business problems or they be, you know, socioeconomic problems or, or health problems like what Olivia was tackling and, and what we tried to tackle in, in our app that I'm going to demo today. Yeah, that's a powerful story. This is the first time I've heard it. Um, and what what credit to a leveraging your skill set and Olivia's case, her skill set to take a very inefficient experience from a user perspective on getting these appointments scheduled and using that for the greater good of society. I mean, wow. I mean, I, I love this kind of tech already, but to be able to make a direct impact on people's lives, that that's what it's all about. The fact that we can take these principles, take the tooling that's available. Anybody watching this now could easily find resources to get started with, you know, application development, whether it's in the shiny space or beyond, like they're, they're out there. You just have to have the time and the initiative to go for it. And yeah, that's both a, a, a very resonating story. Also, frankly, a bit sad that, like you said, whoever was being tasked to make that interface that everybody was going to obviously did not get the job done from a UX perspective, to say the least. And I'm very excited to kind of see where what directions people take when they can leverage tech that's out there, even if it is more manual to start with, like scraping web endpoints or scraping pages for content. It's not easy, but it certainly can be done. And I'm, I'm certainly going to look at that uh, interview that you will have a link to in the show notes on that story. That's very powerful. Yeah, we, we did put the link in there for you to watch her, her interview on CNN. And, you know, it's not to it's not a story to throw stones at anybody in particular, but it's really to, again, try to highlight the tools that we now have in our ecosystem today and, and, and really probably the hockey stick growth that the open source community has experienced, uh, you know, in the last five, 10 years that just give us, you know, so much power to quickly iterate and quickly develop really, really powerful things. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, it's a perfect segue to one of the main things I wanted to talk to you about today is for those that um, aren't aware, I did allude to it at the top. Mike and I have been co-hosting the Our Weekly Highlights podcast, one of my separate ventures. And he and I are, are very much self-professed shiny geeks. We love doing all things with shiny, making it as intricate, as innovative as possible, and blending in multiple tech together. So we've shared a lot of stories off the mic, you might say. But now, today, you are going to be able to share with our audience a really terrific application in the spirit of the story you just mentioned with Olivia, and it's been released out in the open even better with that open source philosophy and providing tremendous value um, to the users that we're about to talk about. So why don't you tell our listeners kind of the origins of the Connecticut COVID test locator app that you've been working on? Sure, sure. So I think it was probably right around the, the turn of the new year, uh, late December of 2021, early January of 2022. And I would log on to, to, to Facebook over the holidays. And our town has a community forum Facebook page. And a lot of folks uh, in that Facebook page said that they had been driving around to a bunch of different locations trying to find at-home COVID tests because maybe they needed them for their kids to get back into school or, or back into daycare, or they needed them for their job, or you know they weren't feeling well and, and they were trying to find one. And uh, people were commenting on these long Facebook threads, you know, saying, "Hey, I, I saw one over here the other day, but it was you know hours after the person had gone out driving around trying to find one." And it was like almost every day multiple people were just starting brand new threads on this Facebook page about where in the world could they get a COVID test. And it was very difficult um, because this is a page that had so much activity on it. Otherwise, um, it was very difficult to kind of backtrack and see, hey, where did the last person, you know, say that they saw a COVID test so that I can go out and try to find one. 
so immediately saw a problem that I thought could be potentially solved um, with some technology help. Thought of Olivia Adams' story. Uh, thought of the Waze app, which is the traffic app that you allows you to spot. Hey, I you know I saw a pothole on this road right here, or hey, on the on the highway that there's a police officer here. You might want to slow down um, for anybody or there's an accident um, for anybody that's used that Waze app before. I said, hey, th there might be some congruency between, you know, kind of what that app tries to accomplish and maybe a way that I could build a shiny app for where I spotted an at-home COVID test in stock so that folks don't have to just drive around aimlessly to, to 10 locations to try to find one. Um, so that is kind of exactly the, the route that I went out to do. I had, you know, a, a wireframe a UI in my mind of kind of what it was going to look like. But I knew that in order to do a, a lot of the location work, uh, we were going to have to ensure that a valid location was provided right. um, for folks that go onto this app. And we'll show that we'll show that shortly. But it um, was a project in which I, I used some new technology that I had never used before in terms of working with the Google Maps. API and it's a very kind of Google Maps like experience, uh, you know, similar to any any of those traffic apps, just with a, a spin on it for, um, hey, you know, this is the location exactly where where I spotted an at home COVID test. This is the time and this is the place. So uh, we spun that up kind of as, as quickly as possible. This is I think we're going to talk about building production grade apps later in this podcast, but this was sort of uh, contrary to that. This was really a, a speed to get this solution out as fast as possible because I saw that there was a big need locally. Yeah. And, you know, once we did push that out to the community, um, we got some phenomenal response, some phenomenal feedback that we were able to incorporate into an improved user experience. And, you know, because it's it's software, we're able to continuously iterate it, continuously improve on it and, and build it towards something that looked a lot more production grade that we'll show today. Yeah, well, that's a great setup. So yeah, let's uh, let's see what the app looks like in action and we'll get dive into some of the code behind it. Sure. Currently, it's just launched on, on shinyapps.io. It's a, a public facing app. This is the homepage with just a, a pretty simple, searchable, reactable table um, that allows you to see uh, the, the most recent Test it's it's sorted by date uh, descending, so it looks like about three days ago was, was the last spotted test. It gives you the name of the location here. It gives you the, the full address because you know, there could be multiple CVSs in one town. Uh, it gives you the brand if you know it of the at-home COVID test uh, that you saw there, and it gives you the the inventory amount, the date, and the time of day that it was spotted. So if you're just logging on to try to see where the most recent Tests were because you're looking for one. Um, this is this is where you would land, and this is kind of the only functionality that you would use. Um, if you did go somewhere and spot that there were either tests in stock at that location or tests out of stock at that location, you could use either one of these big buttons up here on the top to click to report tests in stock. And that'll take you to this, this separate page um, with this pretty simple UI, UI uh, experience where you have a few drop downs to select from over here on the left side of the screen. Um, so we can say, you know, hey, we saw, you know, the, the FlowFlex or the, or the Quick View brand, or maybe it was some other brands, or maybe I'm not even sure what brand it was. Um, so I can pick from that drop down pretty easily. I have the ability to tell you that there were a lot in stock or maybe there were just a few left in stock. So, so you might want to uh, gas pedal over there. And then you can pick the date that you saw them in stock. And we just limit it to the last five days um, because if you saw a COVID test in stock, you know, more than five days ago, I, I would say that there's a pretty good chance that it's probably out of stock by now if they haven't haven't restocked. So we wanted to, to limit it to a fairly narrow time frame here. And then if we choose uh, the time of day that we saw that, uh, we could say, you know, the afternoon. Let's do yesterday afternoon. We saw the quick view, not too many in stock. And let's say that we saw them at uh, maybe just one of my favorite local restaurants. Well, <laughs> even though this wouldn't, uh, this wouldn't necessarily 
make a whole lot of sense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying to think uh, of a little, I, I'll do a, uh, I'll, I'll do the Walgreens in, um, let's do the, do the Walgreens on York Street in New Haven, Connecticut. Let's do that. So we have the nice autocomplete feature here, which is very similar to that, that Google Maps. Um, API experience. Right. You, know, you do you do have the ability to to blow this up into a full full screen map if you wanted to as well. But this should look, you know, very similar to uh, you know what you would experience if you did go on maps.google.com um, with this nice searchable autocomplete bar. Once you've made that selection, uh, it we have this this nice little text above that just grabs that address that you selected to to show you exactly the address that that you chose because um, some of this is cut off in this search bar. So it's just just sort of small uh, help for user experience. Um, and if we did omit one of these one of these things, like let's say um, we forgot to include, uh, it's, it's too late now because I picked a uh, <laughs> I picked a location, but we do have error messages in modals. and I'll show that in just a second. So if we submitted this, We'll get a nice pop up, and this is one of the the user experience things that I try to incorporate in almost any app is is sort of a two step submission process. Yes, because I don't want folks to accidentally click a button. I've done that a million times uh, on a web page. I was just in, I think, a, a Teams meeting the other day, and I accidentally denied somebody uh, from that meeting, and we didn't know. <laughs> I, I Googled it. I couldn't figure out how to get them back in that meeting. So that's why oh, wow. I'm very passionate about a, a two-step process for, for submission uh, or submitting information like that. So we have a little uh, form that pops up here, a nice, nice modal that says, hey, these are the selections that you made. Can you just quickly review them? Um, if you don't you know, think that they're right, go back. Otherwise, uh, you know, submit them. And when you submit them, it'll update that table uh, that we saw on the home screen. So I'll click the submit button real quick here. Hopefully nobody logs on in the next, you know, 90 seconds and thinks that there are tests uh, in New Haven. <laughs> right now, maybe there are, but I'll click submit, say that we saw them yesterday afternoon. We get a little button that says, thank you for your submission uh, to see your changes reflected on the home page. You're going to have to refresh your browser. And if you notice, we also jumped back that submit button is tied to jumping back to the home page I, yes. I had built some apps in the past uh, that were sort of just web forms essentially and I noticed that some folks were submitting the same thing twice uh, maybe because they weren't sure if it actually went through the first time that they clicked the submit button right so from a, a UX perspective I, I thought that this was kind of a, a clever small way to help folks realize that their submission had gone through by jumping back to this home page, um, jumping away from that that submission page, put it that way. So if we refresh our browser here, we'll see that we have a new um, entry here that the Walgreens that we picked in New Haven, Connecticut, you know, yesterday afternoon has the quick view in stock. So let's say that I drive to that Walgreens in New Haven uh, today, this morning. Uh, and I saw that there were there were none in stock. They were totally out. So I can click on, on this button here. I can say that you know today, this morning, I saw at the Walgreens on York Street in New Haven. Let's say I, I don't I don't click that. Um, and if I did try to submit this, it says it, we get a nice uh, oops modal that says, hey, it looks like you forgot something. Uh, make sure that that you enter your address in the map. Yep. This is we a technique I use all the time as well. I, I'm, I think I call it defending my UI or something like that, where yes. you want to make sure that the user, whether it was on purpose or by accident, does not trigger, a, you know, what could be a catastrophic end to their session if something's not there where they expect it to be there. <laughs> yeah. And maybe we'll talk about some of those, those caveats later, but, um, yep. I'll just walk you through kind of what this experience would be like to remove that say, hey, this morning I went to that Walgreens and, and there was nothing there. Uh, I'm submitting that to see our changes. Then we should see this first entry disappear uh, from the table. It's great when things work. 
isn't it? So. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, 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 I've had a rough uh, month or so with some things going, going crazy. Um, but yes, it's nice when demos work. <laughs> yes. So that is, I mean, there's not a whole lot to this app. Um, really just hoping that it, it, it functions for kind of the base needs that, you know, our local community here in Connecticut needs. Uh, you know, we'll talk about some of the future plans for this app and, and it, it coincides with, I think how, you know, at home testing supply ha has gone up and some of the things that the government ha has done lately and, and right. probably, um, you know, where COVID cases are and things like that. But hopefully that gives folks an idea about what the user experience for this app looks like. Yeah. And it is extremely polished. I mean, you, you've been humble to say that this is, you know, getting this out the door quickly, but I mean, I see other, times where people try to get some out the door quickly of a shiny app and it doesn't look nearly as polished as this so certainly great attention to detail here and this is a microcosm even at this scale as one of the quotes i've had in previous episodes it's never just shiny so here i'm already seeing interactions with like you said the google maps api i love to dive into how that works and being able to track these entries track these operations in a central way so yeah. i see lots of fun things we can we can talk about on the back end of this because yes. it's a great use case for how you can blend multiple uh pipelines and multiple services together in one place yes thank you i appreciate that yeah you know uh, maybe it's a t it's the tufty in me but I, I did try to take the approach that, that less is more i didn't go crazy with uh, making some some background color very obvious green and red, green and red buttons as yep. you can see for you know good in stock bad out of stock um, and trying to make you know as few clicks as possible for for the user absolutely so um i i just mentioned a couple of areas i'm interested in maybe if you could walk us through some of how the how the app works kind of in the in the code sense and what kind of things you're most proud of and in, in terms of what the app is doing here. Yeah, I would love to. Um, maybe the, the first thing that I'll walk you through is that that Google um, Maps experience. Yes, that we have. So I will bring up um, how about the GitHub repository as well. So like I said, this project is open source. So if you go to github.com slash catchbrook analytics COVID test spotter, uh, we do have it, it, what I think is, is a pretty detailed readme um, that shows you kind of how to reproduce this whole entire exact process for yourself if you wanted to do that for your own state um, or, or some particular location. So it, it walks you through everything that you're going to need from the Google uh, APIs standpoint. So the the use um, the the widget for that map really calls for two APIs. So the the first is that Maps JavaScript API that is just sort of like a leaflet map. Uh, if you're familiar with Leaflet, where it, it just really shows you the map, allows you to zoom in, zoom out, things like that. The second API is, is the Places API from Google, which is what supports that autocomplete in the search box for us. So you need both of those to get kind of that whole map experience working. And fortunately, the Google Way package is an R package that really allows us to uh, simplify that, that whole process. Nice. That's yes. great that it's out there. Awesome. It's an incredible package. So this is on the server side. Uh, this is we had to make two maps. Um, you can't use the same output twice in your shiny app just so users know that was something that i uh learned the hard way for a bit so you, you remember <laughs> that we have one map on the you know i found tests in stock page and then there's also another map on the tests out of stock page so those are actually separate outputs on the server side and this google way package has a, a render google map function perfect for shiny uh, you build this this google map object so very similar to, to kind of how you would do render leaflet and then with leaflet um, inside of it, you have to pass it your API key, which is this first argument that we have, which we set as an environment variable, just using a, a .r environ file. We have the search box as true, as you saw that, that we enabled that search box on the map. 
you have an event return type, which is, okay, once the user interacts with this map and, and makes a selection in that search uh, box, how do you want that data to be returned as? I, I think you have a few different options. There might be like a, a JSON option, but we have it returned as an R, a simple R list with a bunch of different components there that you have the ability to choose from, which we'll see uh, down here when we actually grab that for the text that we displayed above the map uh, once they selected their location. A starting location for the map, which we did for Hartford, Connecticut, which is at the center of Connecticut uh, for the Zoom user experience on that map. And then there are a couple different um, extra things. If you're ever on Google Maps yourself, you know that there's a, a couple extra widgets to like go into street view and things like that that we didn't need um, for this app. It, it, you know, it didn't make sense for the user experience. So we set those two things to false so that we just really have the search bar on that map. We have the ability to zoom in and zoom out. And then we have, you know, your pinged location that you selected. Um, yeah, so that looks is, like a really clean implementation. I'll have to check out that package after this. Very nice. Phenomenal implementation makes my life incredibly easy. Um, standing this stuff up on the on the server side of Shiny, and then to grab that information, which is you know how we populate the table, and it's it's how we populate that text above the map, telling them you know what the exact location is that they selected. We automatically get this uh, input from this map in output. Uh, it, it's named for us map in underscore place search. So it uses whatever the, the first part of your output is, whatever you name that. So I named it, it map in. And then all you have to do is tack on this, this underscore place search. You have that input at the ready for you. And that is a list. If you remember, that's how we had it returned to us uh, in the Google map function. And we can extract the element of that list that's called address. Yeah, this is an interesting thing that I want to highlight here for those that may be kind of new to blending these different packages into a Shiny app. Packages like what you're showing with Google Way and others like DT, where if you put them in Shiny and you enable certain flags, you get that input free of charge to do things with. Like in the case of DT, you could have an input to correspond to what row they clicked on in the table or yep. what cell. So this is a very similar thing where it may seem counterintuitive at first, but when you render this, um, in this case, this Google map, you're getting other client side slots from that, that you can do whatever you want in your backend processing. So it's really nice that they expose that for you here. Yes. Yes. It was, it was huge to, you know, the success of this project and, and the speed at which we were able to do these things as opposed to having to, you know, figure out you know, the API itself from, from Google and having to, to right. custom, you know, handwrite a bunch of that code to grab it. So it was very, very helpful. And, um, you know, another example beyond DT might be Plotly, right? If you're in Plotly yes. and you, you, you do a zoom um, with your mouse, there are things that you get on that, at that client side um, for, you know, the exact sort of pixels uh, or location on the map that you, you zoomed into. I think it's, you know, brushing the map, I think is what folks might have seen that referred to as. So we get that uh, input here that we just render as, as text above the map, but then we also uh, capture that and, and send that to uh, the MongoDB cloud database, which is what populates that, that reactable table on the, the home screen there. So I can uh, maybe show where we get that as yeah, well. Yeah, this I'm very intrigued about because I've had some adventures with this in an app I did last year. I'd love to see how you're implementing that here. Yeah, so this is sort of the, the tibble that we create um, with all of the information from the user's inputs if they say that they saw a uh, location in stock. So a lot of this stuff is, again, stuff that we get on the client side from that Google Way uh, API. So we get a specific ID. So Google has a unique ID for every single address, um, which helps us with deduplication. Um, it helps us a ton with deduplication for folks that are submitting, you know, for the same, the same uh, place, you know, say you went out and saw tests available in the morning and I went out and saw tests available at the same site in the evening. We would only want one record in the table that showed that there were tests available in the evening. 
right? Because that would be the most recent uh, observation. So that, sure. that place ID helps us with deduplication. Uh, that name it is is something that we get as well from that list, which you know is usually CVS or Walgreens or Rite Aid or you know uh, your, your local grocery store that we have around here who also sell uh, COVID tests when they have them in, in supply. Address, we get latitude and longitude for um, potentially plotting these things on a map in the future. If we wanted to plot a leaflet map where you could you know, maybe type in your address and see the, get the closest three tests that are available to you or something like that. That's potentially some future music that we haven't gotten to yet. And then we have, you know, their inputs from the drop down filters here, which is uh, the, the brand that they said, you know, whether that be Binax or, or, or Flowflex or, or uh, whatever brand they selected, you know, the inventory amount, which was low, medium or high, the date that they spotted those tests and the time of day, which is morning, afternoon and evening. And again, some of those date and time things, I think that we'll, we'll talk about pretty soon here in terms of uh, user experience, handling, deduplication, and, and some of the tricky stuff that went along uh, with that. So we capture that all just in a simple tibble, and then we are able to uh, have this custom function that is really just an, an insert or an update statement um, I can show kind of on the, the to MongoDB. And that's all, MongoDB has, has this Mongo Lite package that really just allows you to pass a whole data frame to it and upload that to your MongoDB database collection, it's called. So I can go into the Mongo side, Eric. I can go into um, whatever side that you want to see next. I can dive more into the Google Way side. What well, I think, I think uh, we got a nice uh, progression here in terms of like the order of operations. So as a as a data geek here, I'd love to see that implementation of how you got this into into the database. But what I do see a nice pattern of is that you have a nice function here that's very intuitive. We just want to add a record. You made a function called add record. And likewise, you'll have stuff later on, I think, for removing it. Uh, making, making the business logic in your server side component of the app clean and easy to understand is such a valuable skill. And some things I see in my adventures, whether it's at the day job or otherwise, is that when when pe developers don't take a functional approach for these server side slots, you can get lost in looking at all the different things that that backend could do. So I really like the the approach here. It's very intuitive thus far. No, I appreciate it. I think that's that's uh, all of the the Hadley Wickham that I've listened to. And name your <laughs> verbs. Name your verbs. Uh, name your functions as, as verbs that tell you exactly kind of what they're doing. Yep, and exactly. Maybe for, for folks that are interested um, in, in following up on, on what I was talking about in terms of jumping back to the homepage after you've made your submission, um, you know, this is all wrapped up in an observe event once they've clicked that final submit button in, in the modal. So we remove the modal yep. after that record has been added to MongoDB. And then we jump them back using this this nav select from BSLib. Oh, I was BSLib not package. aware of this. I'm going to write this down for my apps next time. I didn't know BSLib could do this. So, wow, nice. So I, I was watching the um, the Colin Fay brochure uh, stream yesterday afternoon, and you know I think there's there's some incredible promise for that whole ecosystem of multi-page shiny apps, right? But we still in my opinion, have a lot of tricks up our sleeve to make it feel like it's a multi-page app. And, and this is this is one of those uh, tricks that, that I found um, really lends itself to, to, to making sort of a multi-page user experience. Yep. So Good you, you can set, um, you know, you can set an, an HTML uh, ID for, or I guess a CSS ID um, for the UI component that is your, your nav bar. And you can use this nav select function from BSLib, BSLib to uh, you know jump back to whichever tab on your nav bar you want to to jump to. Yeah, um, so I've been doing pretty, this a little cool. bit with the uh, apps I made that use say BS4 Dash or Shiny Dashboard Plus to kind of do a similar paradigm. But it's nice to see that we can do this in a more you might call classical uh, Shiny UI as well. Yeah. 
Yes. So I think if I I could show you the if I can find where that originally is just up in the yeah. So that, that's right at the top of our UI. We we assign that ID to our our page nav bar that nav bar ID. So hopefully that um, speaks for itself. On yes. How that all works. And and big plug the BS Live. I can see you're using that for the the styling of the app, and that makes it so easy for people to have an app that doesn't look like the typical template that you get when you watch one in say our studio or something. So great touch there as well. I had one of my favorite compliments from a client the other day, and it was that our shiny apps don't look like shiny apps. And I think that's that's <laughs> that's maybe the best compliment that I could ever get. Yeah, and some people might be like, oh, the same way. don't you want it to look like shiny? No, actually, it, Winston himself was bemoaning this back many years at our studio comp where he thought all the examples were looking the same. So there's no excuse now. Um, that's awesome. <laughs> so the... Uh, you know, if you submit that a test was out of stock, um, very, very similar, uh, you know, code here that we have. We have a, a smaller tibble that we're putting together, um, just using that that place ID mm -hmm. value, and then we have a function instead of add record. This one's called remove record, and then the same sort of user experience. So I can jump into those functions next in terms of the add record and, and remove record. So, Mike, I can already tell um, what the work you've been doing with the um, with this app. There's so much to cover and we've only scratched the surface. So um, I would love to have you back on next time to talk about some of the more back end features of this. Um, I saw some great connections to the database and some of the ways you dealt with the API. So um, would you like to come back on next time? Yeah, let's make it a part two. Let's do that. So folks, um, stay tuned for part two. We will have all the links to everything we discuss in this first uh, first half of the of the series um, in the episode show notes on the new we revamp shinydevseries.com. So until then, we'll see you at part two very soon. Bye, everybody.